This week on the No More Late Fees podcast, Jackie and I joined by Brian Morrison of the Free Blockbuster Movement. Free Blockbuster Organization helps people install movie boxes in communities so residents can leave or borrow movies. Welcome, Brian. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I of course. It. As soon as as I saw this on Instagram and saw that there was this whole movement, especially during the pandemic, I was like, oh, this is super cool. We actually met, connected with people who we saw making some really cool boxes. One person, they had like a really cool box that they made. And then I hired them to make Jackie a bird box that, cause they made like a little storefront for Blockbuster. It was so cool. And then I, I was like, there's somebody behind this account. I have to find out. So Jackie and I talked about it and ta-da, here's Brian. So Brian, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and the free blockbuster movement? Sure. Well, gosh, I mean, myself, I, here I am. I live in Los Angeles. I, like you guys, am a fan of movies and popular culture. And like a lot of people here in LA, I have a lot of friends who are fans of movies and popular culture. And one of them was moving from LA back to New York City and had a whole closet full of movies, DVDs, and VHS tapes that she was not going to take with her. And at the time, we had heard that Goodwill wasn't even accepting VHS tapes. They were just sending them right to the dumpster. Oh, wow. And we thought, well, well there's got to be a better way to share these collections that we've all amassed, right? We all have boxes of movies sitting around. That we don't maybe look at that often anymore. We were always taught to share as kids. So maybe we can bring some of that learning back and, uh, and figure out a way to do it. And that's kind of the beginning of Free Blockbuster, for me, anyway. My friend that I mentioned earlier lived very close to where the Blockbuster was in my neighborhood of Los Angeles, which is Los Feliz. And I reached out to them and I asked if we could build a free Blockbuster or a free little movie library at their location. They said no. But at the same time, our little free weekly alternative newspaper was kind of being killed by its new owners, sadly, right? They, these new, a, new, a new group had acquired it. They were kind of scaling it down, and part of scaling it down was eliminating all of the street street news racks where they distributed the paper. Yeah. And so we have all these empty newspaper boxes sitting around the city, just like becoming blight and collecting trash. So we took one over and put movies in it, and that is where Free Blockbuster started for us here in Los Angeles. I don't claim to have invented this idea. I'm sure someone started a free movie library prior to that, Yeah, but that's where it started for me. Well, that's really cool. What year was that when you started it? It started in 2019. Mm -hmm. The idea came in 2018, but it took a little while to actually like bring to life. Yeah. Well, super cool. And yeah, we, it's like you said, we've seen around the country, there's book sharing kind of systems. People have done it with food. So I've seen even puzzle boxes now. Yeah. And I think, I think that's wonderful. I feel like it's something that we have to start to get back to is building community. And I think if COVID taught us anything, it's definitely something that we should try to be more connected in different ways. And I, I think it's cool to bring in the whole physical media part of it. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a huge physical media collection yourself? I can't say that I have a huge physical media collection because now through this, I'm connected to a lot of people who have huge physical media. <laughs> <laughs> I have a small physical media collection. It was funny. I was interviewed by a, a, a younger person or someone who's younger than me, right? Younger mm -hmm. to the point where they did not really grow up with physical media, right? They, yeah. they came into things in the streaming age. And they asked, when did you start collecting VHS tapes? And it was funny for me to think about that because back when I started collecting them, they were just movies, right? Yeah. Right. I wasn't like collecting this kitschy throwback thing. It was like how you had to own a copy of Austin Powers. It was like the only way to do it. Yeah. So, you know, I, I still have a, a little collection of tapes that are special to me or things that are not available elsewhere. But I don't, I'm not, a, I don't like to think of myself as a collector 
the way a lot of people are. I, most of the media in this room is destined for a free blockbuster point. Is destined for a free blockbuster box at some point. <laughs> How did you, when did, like, when was the moment you realized that, that the program had, like, taken off? It's a really, it's, it's hard to pinpoint, you know. My first free blockbuster was premiered in February of 2019. Mm -hmm. And then sometime mid that, very soon after, to the point where I don't know if we started or if, he started yeah. this other location called Video Honor System, which is also here in Los Angeles, started. Mm -hmm. And then like halfway through that year, VHS and Chill in Oklahoma City opened up a free <laughs> blockbuster. So that's the first free blockbuster outside of LA. And that was like really cool to see that someone else had saw what I was doing and like thought it was cool and decided mm -hmm. to do it as well. And then about a year after starting, like in early 2020, and I, I can't say the pandemic didn't have something to do with it, right? Yeah. We started to see them pop up more frequently. And so it was really mid-2020 when things started to happen in a way that I, I never expected that they would. And so you used to work at a video store, correct? I worked at a Blockbuster in Pennsylvania. I also worked at a different video store in central Pennsylvania when I was in college. <laughs> so yeah, I worked I worked at both Blockbuster and non-Blockbuster video stores. Did you have a preference? Like, did it matter? Did you like one better than the other? <laughs> I don't have a ton of Blockbuster nostalgia. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's a very identifiable brand. Right. And I've had those, we've had those conversations with people who own the Blockbuster brand. I don't think that what I'm doing would have been as sticky if we hadn't called it Blockbuster. Mm. To be honest, I was more of a West Coast video guy growing Ooh. up. That was our local store. I don't know if you guys know West Coast Video. I, I don't. Do you, Jackie? No. Mm -mm. That was a small chain that we had, like, I guess it was in the Northeast. We also had a local video store, Springfield Video. Shout out to Springfield Video, which is now gone. Yeah. And I think at the time, we saw Blockbuster as almost kind of like the enemy, right? Because they were coming in and they were putting all these little stores out of business. It was like, yeah. you've got mail style. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was also the place to work if you were someone in the suburbs who loved movies. It was yeah. the place to go to be around this thing that you loved and to like get your three free rentals a week or whatever it was and to see the stuff that came out early. So yeah, I guess the store I'm nostalgic for was West Coast Video, also Springfield Video, which was not my local video store, but definitely the place we hung out more like in high school. I worked at Blockbuster. I also worked at Mike's Video in Central Pennsylvania, which was cool because it was like a chain of three stores. Mm -hmm. And it was the closest that I ever got to that, like that thing we all wanted, which was to work at Empire Records. A hundred percent. Blockbuster was an Empire Records. Blockbuster was kind of music town, right? Yeah. It was. But Mike's video in Central Pennsylvania, like, gave us our name tag where we put our favorite movie on there. It had the, like, the employee selection wall. And that was a pretty cool experience, too. I believe, I mean, I'm pretty sure that those are all gone now, too, so. Yeah, it's really sad. That entire experience is just gone. Mm -hmm. And to your point, like the thing that we desperately, the thing that we really need is in movies, it's interaction with our community. And that place provided a forum for us to interact with other people who love movies, for other kids in the suburbs who wanted to talk about Kevin Smith or whatever it was, or that I could go in there and get a recommendation from someone who would recommend something that isn't going to get a bunch of play normally, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. That was a place that the video store was for us in that time. And we believe that free blockbuster can be and has been for people. In Chicago, it's groups of guys just like collecting on the street to talk about movies outside of a free blockbuster or kids who look forward to going to the box to see what tapes they're going to discover. You know, for an eight-year-old, free blockbuster is not a nostalgic experience. It's a future experience. And that's exactly. the thing I try to stick on. I love that. Thank you.
<laughs> do you, did you do you have any keepsakes from your time working at the different video stores? Yeah, I mean, I have my name tags, I'm sure, somewhere for Aww. both. Nice. Uh, I have my original Blockbuster membership card, but like, I don't have it. Like, my friend Nick, shout out to Nick Luciano, who was also part of the inspiration for Free Blockbuster. He has a lot of great mementos, including the tapes that used to play on the TVs. And then mm -hmm. the show, like, what's coming up? He's got a whole library of those. So that's pretty. Oh, wow. Yeah, you know, I guess a lot of us who worked at Blockbuster also kind of became. Blockbuster stands, right, in some way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of which, we actually mentioned you in our last interview because we were talking to Taylor, who is the director of the last Blockbuster movie. So he says hello, by the way. <laughs> so it just feels like all of a sudden we're in some sort of, to your point, the Blockbuster renaissance, but it's really a video store renaissance, but because mm -hmm. it was just like this monolith of being the biggest i think that's what everyone's kind of feeding into but there's so many other stores that people have you know their hearts are to their local video store but it's great to see like we're getting a tv show that about people working at the last blockbuster we have the last blockbuster we have the documentary we have the blockbuster game free blockbuster movement so that it's just it it feels really great that and you know jackie and i started the podcast but it feels great that other people are having this longing for like you said community essentially mm -hmm. that's really what it is because even if you built a, a blockbuster store right now we talked about that on our episode not really sure where that would go but i think if you were to build something else i mean like here in los angeles you know i i i'll admit i haven't even visited the brick and mortar but the people at whammy analog video are doing amazing stuff they've got a you know it's a combination store and screening area and they're picking out movies that they're screening on vhs that are from underrepresented voices or films that haven't maybe been seen as much as they should have and i think that's like that it is a thirst for community, right? It is people saying, yes, we can do all this stuff online, but we actually want to get together and like interact with each other. It was Natalia from Pussy Riot who gave a PowerPoint presentation. It was called How the United States Can Prepare Combat Tyranny. And she said, one of the best ways to combat tyranny is by building in-person community. And I think that's incredibly strong, right? That is the thing we need is this new institutions, in-person institutions. So a lot of this, I feel like, is coming out of a hunger for that. It's interesting to see younger people being like, here's stuff that 90s kids like. And by that, they mean someone born in like 1998 or 1999. Yeah. Right. And so it's cool to watch kids who have really no active memory of going to the video store feel a nostalgia for it. And I think that's very interesting as well. I think we can, our age, I don't know how old you are, but just from the time periods that you've mentioned, I can guesstimate your not too far away from Jackie and I, but I feel like that's not weird because I felt like I had a nostalgia for the seventies and I was not even born then. Right. Like I wanted to consume everything. And I think what ends up happening and the reason that is, is because at the time that I was, we were in our formative years, the people who were filmmakers at the time they were reminiscing about their childhood and trying to recreate it. And now the people who are filmmakers at this point are people our age who are trying to reminisce about their childhood. And so the younger kids are like, the 90s seem cool. They've never been there. They don't know. And the same thing. I've never been in the 70s. I don't know what. And I barely remember the 80s as yeah. much because I was too young. So, but we have absorbed and consumed so much media that was reflective of that time. So I think it's just, how that works. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Cause when I, I mean, I was born in the early eighties and I love listening to eighties music, but, and all of it is sort of subconsciously appealing because it was what was around in my formative years, I guess. I'm not sure, but you, yeah. you really, you have a great insight on that. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> she wore a lot of bell bottoms in high school. I did. I did. <laughs> I did. I just had my 40th and 
I was trying to find like a theme or things to decorate and I kept going to 70 stuff and I'm like something is wrong with you <laughs> you weren't even born in the 70s so I did read that the company that owns Blockbuster asked you to change free Blockbuster's name is that something that's still happening were you able to resolve that I won't say it's resolved as much as it's like an ongoing conversation they reached out and they said, hey, this is kind of our IP. Can, would you, can you change the name? And I, you know, said we could do that. We could change, I could change the name of the thing that I'm doing, right? Change the website and change the, but I don't think it would be as resonant without this name and logo, you know, and I acknowledged to them that is like, brand equity that their company built over years and years, right? And we were absolutely benefiting from that. And as of now, I wouldn't say it's settled, but they haven't told us to stop. So I don't know if that answers, but it's, it's, you know, it's an ongoing conversation. Yeah, it's such a weird thing because they're obviously not doing anything with the name themselves, but they are not discouraging people if they want to license the name and do all sorts of things so it's just it's like it's almost like they're sitting on a gold mine but i don't know what it doesn't look like they're trying to actively do anything with mm -hmm. it whatsoever i mean it's dish network right who owns these trademarks and they are actively like licensing out those yeah. trademarks like i'm pretty sure that the shirt that i'm wearing was licensed at some <laughs> point right yeah. Or, so, you know, they're protecting it for those reasons. As far as like what their longer term plans are, my understanding is there was like a streaming service in the UK at some point that was Blockbuster branded. I don't know if they intend to use these marks to launch like a sling channel in the future. I kind of asked and they just didn't respond. It's not my business anyway. But like, what would it take to mine that gold mine? I don't know the answer, yet, you know? Yeah. But I, I think at least they are sort of protecting it. As far as what Dish's plans are, we're not making any money off of that. Right. Right? If we were making money, they would probably say, hey, we should get a cut of that. Yeah. But, you know, we aren't. We're spending money to do this thing that we love. So, Right. So if someone is interested in participating or setting up their own free Blockbuster box in their community, what could they do? They should do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay are there any resources or anything that your site provides that they should check out absolutely yeah if you go to a freeblockbuster.org slash found dash a dash franchise there's some basic by the way i want to shout out to my friend mary bullock for creating our website otherwise this information would not be available because <laughs> i'm not good at making websites but there's some basic info on how you can get started and all of our artwork is available for free download. So our goal is to make it as easy as possible for people to participate and as, as inexpensive as possible for people, people to participate. So you can, if you want to download our artwork for free from our website, you could cut, print and cut your own stencil at home and you can build a free blockbuster franchise for as close to free as possible. You might need to buy some paint, you probably have some movies in your basement, let's be honest. And the only thing we ask is that you have movies and that they are free. And if those two conditions are met, we reach out and we'll add you to our map. It doesn't need to be in a newspaper box. It doesn't even really need to be blue and yellow. If there are free movies available to your community, we consider you a free blockbuster. Awesome. That's so cool. I do love on your website. Shout out to Mary for me for making this because uh, you guys have a really cool map and you're you call them your franchises of all the different free blockbuster locations which is really so, so fun one of the things we were talking about on our interview with what? taylor taylor sorry <laughs> brain freeze was the fact that like we have a we have vhs's and stuff like that and it's so hard to get a vcr nowadays it is hard to find them. And, and when you do find them, sometimes they're extremely expensive. So that was, my mom dropped off a bunch of VHSs for me. And luckily she gave me a, a VHS player because I was like, I don't even know if I can find one now. People ask that question, like, who has a VCR anymore? Or sometimes people do say, who has a VHS player anymore? Because we all forgot the word VCR. Yeah. Um, <laughs>
Yeah. Like, what is that called? Oh, right, right, right. Um, I haven't found that they're that challenging to come by. You know, if you look, I have, you now there's like more, like if you're looking for a forehead model or a top loader or like an SVHS VCR that can be more challenging. For me, the hardest part of the whole thing is getting the signal from the VCR to a modern television, which mm -hmm. may or may not have an RCA or coaxial input. And I do have this, I harbor dreams, you know, flights of fancy that <laughs> one day will produce a you know a, a new vcr that has an hdmi built in so you can just up convert in the unit i don't think anyone ever produced anything like that and maybe someday in the far future that dream will be a reality but until then you have to find a vcr and then you have to find a, an appropriate media converter that will upscale to 1080 or whatever it is you're watching which is yeah. you know not the easiest thing in the world especially for a lay person yeah yeah exactly so brian what is your vision for free blockbuster uh, how, you know where do you see it or oh, the movement from five years from now little free library started in 2009 they now have over 9,000 little free libraries free blockbuster started 2019 we now have about 140 so you know in the next five years we can get to 5,000 we'll be on a good track. I don't know if that's what's going to happen. I'd like to see one in every state in the United States. I'd like to see more expansion internationally. It's hard because Blockbuster wasn't all over the world. It was very U.S., Canada, and like Northern Hemisphere centric. Yeah, they had some in Europe. They had some in South America, Mexico, but I don't think it went anywhere else. I did start, we were down in Mexico City at the beginning of this year for a month, and I started our first location in Mexico City. It has not taken off yet, but I'm hoping at some point in the future. So yeah, I guess just continuing to grow, and this has opened me up to so many people that I never even imagined I'd have the chance to meet and have, like, ridiculous conversations about outdated analog formats. In a way, it's connected me to, like, my people in a way that I just never thought it was going to happen. And here, case in point. <laughs> talking with y'all, right? I don't know if we're going to actually get around to having VHS, VCRs produced, but I think, you know, maybe redesigning our artwork to match what the blockbuster people have asked us to do could be mm -hmm. on, on the roadmap for the future, expanding to all 50 states in the union. And also for me, I think preservation is key. You know, I think that work is going to be valuable for us in the future. I know. So like one of the things that I love about the community online, especially like Instagram, Instagram started shutting down and coming down really hard from like a trademark standpoint on people who are making Stan accounts and fan edits. And there's just so many people, especially like VHS collectors and movie collectors. And even just in our time period, I, I mean, not even 60s, 70s, but you know, 90s. Some of these movies are so obscure, they're not on DVD, and people are, you know, making scene packs and sharing them and making different content with it. And it's really sad to see when Instagram and some of these social platforms try to clamp down on it. But I think that some of these companies need to be a little bit more open-minded because it's not taking money away from this piece of content. It's art. And I just feel like the whole idea that art, especially movies, have to have money wrapped up in it takes away from the enjoyment of it. And because people are making these edits, and it might seem silly to have a stand account, but it makes people realize, I never seen that movie, or I didn't know my favorite person was in this movie. Let me go see it or enjoy it or understand it or say, oh my God, I thought I was the only one. That bridges a gap in community. And I, I, I hope that doesn't end because mm -hmm. of them clamping down on, if I can't make for money from it, you can't have it kind of thing. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, the story, I, I think the story of our generation is and will be the rise of the internet. And we remember a time before the internet became big business, when it was really just about sharing information with each other. Right. Yeah. And then it became business and it had to be monetized. And then once we started monetizing things, it becomes 
of great interest to the, to the people who control those platforms to stay in good with the, the people who like generate money making content, right? Mm -hmm. And then you that's when you see things like censorship on YouTube and censorship on Instagram. So now we're in this weird ecosystem. It's interesting because when you think about when culture started, like people would you could you would perform dramatic works for the joy of performing dramatic works, or you know, you might perform and then receive direct benefit from performing for people or perform a song and just receive direct benefit. And then with the advent of industrial processes like the printing press, we started copywriting sheet music, right? And then recording came much later. And now we're in this digital era where everything is a commodity, right? Even this, the idea is a commodity, but weird things are happening because it's not just, okay, well, this distributor isn't even making money off this movie, it should be made available for free. Well, what about if suddenly the distributor has a vested interest in making it not available? What mm -hmm. if, when was the last time you watched the Super Mario Brothers movie? Let me ask you that question. Not in a long time. The movie or the cartoon? The movie from, with John Leguizamo and Bob Hoskins. N not in a long time. My brother pointed out to me, if you try to go rent the Super Mario Brothers movie on like Amazon, it's not there. Because there's a new Super Mario Brothers movie coming out later this year. Mm -hmm. And they have gone through great lengths to scrub the old one from the internet. It is not available. So even if you want to experience that artwork that hundreds of people contributed to the creation of, that is culturally significant for a number of reasons, you can't because they don't want you to have it right now. And that's censorship. And that's seriously problematic as we move into this ne next era and figure out what life is going to look like. Do we want to give? large organizations the ability to erase things from culture i, I mean no you could even tr really trace back some of this a lot of this to disney and mm -hmm. i think it's unfortunate because disney does make so much of the art that we love but if you think about how there are some of these fairy tales and stuff like yes our generation especially you know thinks Disney, but these stories were before that. And the fact that Disney changed the laws for things going back out into the public and being able to be used for public consumption. And they're re the reason why like some of, we have such stringent laws about some of these characters and stuff like that. It Like when I learned that I was I'm like, this sucks. This is preventing everyday people to make really creative stories with some of our favorite characters because of imminent domain it's it pisses me off it's what it, well and they they kind of paved the way for gatekeeping of their movies because they would put them in the vault and then it would be like on an anniversary or something it's back from the vault and create this demand for it because it hasn't been available for so long and they were able to like resell it. And every time they would release it, it would be something different, more footage, like different extras. Then it was like, well, you need the Blu-ray copy because it was only on DVD before. And so they've always done things to kind of keep that demand for the movie. And it's, it, creates almost a sense of panic. Like I have to buy it because what if it goes back in the vault? I won't be able to get it again. Yep. And that's why if you look at our website, you know, it's, our mission is to combat the myth of scarcity by providing free entertainment to as many people as possible. And what I mean by myth of scarcity is that there's no reason anyone can't see Pinocchio anytime they want to, except mm -hmm. that Disney has created an artificial scarcity around right. Pinocchio. Right. And that was necessary back when they started their vault strategy, they would, things would come out of theaters and they would occasionally release them back into theaters. Right. Mm -hmm. And then as television exhibition and then later home video exhibition became real, the vault strategy expanded right to, to what it is now, but we have digital we have the ability to copy everything infinitely. Right. So the idea, yes. the idea of scarcity is false it is a yeah. lie that is that is used to benefit and listen i love disney i love the work that they make largely because they bring the best artists of any era into what they're doing because they have a lot, a lot of money to do it right, right? Mm -hmm. would howard ashton and malin mankin have gone on to do something else if they hadn't been paid to do the little murray of course they would have 
Yes. But instead, Disney, Michael Eisner, and, and Jeffrey Katzenberg paid them to go from, from Little Shop of Horrors into Little Mermaid, and they did The Little Mermaid, so we love The Little Mermaid. Disney didn't create that. Howard Ashton and Alan Menken and John Musser and Ron Clements and all those incredible artists did, and they happened to work for that company. Right. So the first for me when dealing with the Disney question is to recognize that I can love the art and still ask questions about the company. Right. Uh, and I do love the art and I do ask questions about the company. <laughs> and I, I have to say, you know, are you, and sometimes they are an incredible, what's the word I'm looking for? Shepherd of our shared culture. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I applaud them when they do that. And sometimes they do things that are icky. And then let's talk about it when they do it, right? So, yeah. But yeah, we don't really, like, the idea of scarcity, I'm sorry, scarcity, yeah, in a lot of ways, the idea of scarcity helps to benefit people who are hoarding resources, right? Mm -hmm. But we live on a planet that was, that, it, that belongs to all of us and has everything we need to survive, right? In fact, everything we use comes from the, our planet, right? And that is a gift to all of us. So anyway, that's sort of, it's our little revolution and we fight that revolution by sharing with each other because in the end that all we have is what came from the earth anyway. And that is why when we say you're returning movies, even if you're donating something that you bought in the end, you're returning it back into the great collective ownership that we all come from. I love that, Brian. Yeah. Thank you. I hope it's not <laughs> weird. Is that weird? No, no, no not at all. And if someone thinks it's weird, fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you know, if you think it's weird, please go to freeblockhunters.org. There's a contact page. Hit me up and let me know. And we can talk. <laughs> I guess Brian had a nicer way. As Jackie said, I have a way with words. We want everybody. Yes. You know, <laughs> everyone is invited to this part. As my friend Pete once said, the, the best and worst thing about punk rock is everyone's invited. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for letting me be a part of this journey for you. And I, if I may speak to that audience, I would say, please consider starting a free blockbuster <laughs> in your community. If you have any questions, fill out that contact form on the website and uh, mention that uh, Jackie and Danielle sent you and I will personally assist. So <laughs> Awesome. And we'll make sure to include the link below mm -hmm. in the description of this episode. And before Brian leaves us, why don't you tell everyone where they can find you on social so they can check out and engage with you? In most cases, we are at Free Blockbuster, except okay. for on Twitter, where <laughs> that was already taken by some spam account from 10 years ago. We are free blockbuster with a zero in, in place of the, 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 the O. So free BL zero CK buster. Yeah, that's it. Facebook, Instagram. We have a YouTube channel. I'm trying to get us up to 100 so we can claim a name. But otherwise, if you Google free blockbuster, you'll find us. And I think those are it's we're really we're very Instagram head. It's our primary platform. We'll definitely check out Brian. And as always, you can check us out at No More Late Fees on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. And as always, be kind and rewind. <laughs>